Good morning. Good morning. We are glad that you are here for the worship service of the Alma Christian Church this morning. We are glad that uh, if you are watching online, that you can join us that way. And we pray that you will be blessed by being with us this morning. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 96, the first three verses. It says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless His name. Proclaim good tidings of His salvation from day to day. Tell of His glory among the nations, His wonderful deeds among all the peoples. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this day. We thank You for the opportunity we have to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the body of Christ, to praise and to worship, to meet you at your table, to open your word and, and hear it proclaimed. And we just pray for your presence among us this morning. And we pray that all that we say and do today will bring glory and honor to you. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I readily confess it to you. God, you see and know everything. You see and know my heart. You know all of us completely, and yet you love us fully and totally. You simply want us to come to you. You are the giver of grace, the giver of life, the giver of love. We say thank you for all these things during this time. Most especially for the love and grace of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice you paid on the cross for our sins. To allow us to be with you for eternity. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
And I think it fits in quite well with uh, what Andy's been discussing the last couple of weeks. I like looking at the Old Testament and I like looking at the stories of the Old Testament because there's always lots of neat details there. There's always lots of things that we can learn when we go to those stories. And this story is no exception. In 2 Kings 5, we find a, a great story about a great man. And uh, the story happens during the time of the life of Elisha. Naaman was a great general for the kingdom of Aram. And he is the principal part of the story. But we're also going to learn about a Jewish servant girl and a couple of other servants and Elisha as well. 2 Kings 5 tells us that Naaman was a great man. In fact, in the first verse of the fifth chapter, we learn all we need to know about Naaman. This is what 2 Kings 5, 1 says. Now Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. That's all you need to know. That's all you need to know about Naaman in one verse of Scripture. A great man, a great soldier, a victorious soldier, but he had a problem. He was a leper. Now, we also learned when we looked at the story that there was a Jewish girl that was a part of Naaman's household. She had been brought into the kingdom as a result of Naaman's victories. And this Jewish girl approached her mistress and told her that she should have Naaman go to see the prophet Elijah in Samaria and that the prophet could heal him. In 2 Kings 5, verse 3, she said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So, we see, we see Naaman. We see he's a great man. We see he's got a problem. We see a servant girl. She says, I've got the solution. And she approaches her mistress and tells her to tell Naaman what to do. Naaman goes to the king of Aram, shares the information with him, and because of his high regard for Naaman, he says, I'm going to write a letter. And he writes a letter that Naaman can take to the king of Israel and that should help facilitate the healing of Naaman. And he sends gifts along that he can share. And so Naaman takes the gifts and he takes his entourage and they go to the king of Israel They give him the letter from the king of Aram and the letter spells out Naaman's here so that he can be healed. And the king had a heart attack. No, he didn't have a heart attack. But he wasn't happy. The king looked at that letter and he thought, how am I going to heal this guy? And the, the scripture says that he tore his robes and began to mourn because he felt like the king of Aram was up to something and then he was trying to, to use this as an excuse to attack his kingdom. While all of this is going on, the prophet Elijah is at home. In this story, the prophet Elijah never leaves the house. It's like he's under quarantine. Never leaves the house. He sends word to the king of Israel 
he says, send Naaman to me. Send him over here to me. I'll take care of this. 2 Kings 5, verse 8. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So, the king of Israel delivers that message to Naaman. Naaman takes his entourage and moves on to Elisha's house. When he pulls up at the front door, Elisha sends a servant out. He doesn't come out. He sends a servant out to talk to this great man, and he tells Naaman, now you go and wash seven times in the Jordan, and you will be healed. 2 Kings 5 says, Naaman was not happy. He was not happy. He was used to being treated with a little more respect than he was being treated with. I mean, at least the prophet could come out and talk to me face to face. He sends this servant out. Then he tells me to go wash in the muddy Jordan. He was not happy. And the scripture tells us that. In 2 Kings 5, beginning with the 10th verse, it says, Elisha sent a messenger to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my lips. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. made this trip been given a solution but it's not the one that he wanted now it looks like he's going to go home mad Naaman had some other servants with him and now they approach him and they try to reason with him in 2 Kings 5 verse 13 it says Naaman's servants went to him and said my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? Those servants had some influence with Naaman. Because after they approached Naaman with some logic. After Naaman had, had a chance to cool down, it says that at their urging he went and did as Elisha said. And he was immediately cleansed after dipping seven times in the Jordan. What's really important is not the cleansing of Naaman's leprosy. What's really important is what happened to Naaman after the cleansing took place. Because as a result of that cleansing, he became filled with a desire to serve God for the rest of his life. In 2 Kings 5, Verse 17. He tries to give Elisha all of these gifts. And Elisha says, I don't want those gifts. I'm not taking those gifts. 
And Naaman replies with this. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. Now that's a great story that shares with us the power of God and the power of being the witness. I'm going to share several things with you this morning. Not everything because we'd be here a lot longer than the time I have if we tried to touch on everything. But quickly let me share with you five things I think we can learn from this story. First of all, Anyone can be a witness. Anyone can be a witness. And if you doubt that, let me remind you that we have all been called to be witnesses. Jesus' final words to his disciples were, you go and you be my witnesses. In Matthew 28 chapter, beginning with verse 18, it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. There's no qualifier in that statement. Jesus is saying, if you are my disciple, then you are my witness. Very clear statement. In the story of Naaman, we find a Jewish captive slave girl and some other servants who step up and share a witness. Now, I'm pretty sure that that was a nerve-wracking thing to do for both the girl and the other servants as well. But they shared in spite of the uncertainty. You see, anyone can be a witness because the first requirement to being a witness is being willing to share. Secondly, you need no special knowledge to be a witness. Many times, many times we do not witness because we feel that we don't possess adequate knowledge. We feel like we need to, to know the scriptures better or, or, or we need to know where we go to find this or, you know, we, we think that there's some special knowledge attached to being a witness. Now it is important to possess knowledge of what the Scripture says and we do need to spend time on a regular basis studying what it says. In fact, Paul would remind Timothy of this in 2 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 15, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. There is a place for knowing why you believe what you believe. But the most important thing is you don't have to have every chapter and verse memorized to be able to share the knowledge of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Studying the Word and knowing what it says is important. But the most important thing about being a witness is that you have the opportunity to share your personal experience. Remember the story of Jesus healing the blind man in John the ninth chapter? It's one of my favorite stories in, in the book of John. 
story where Jesus heals the blind man and as a result of the healing, the religious leaders lose their minds. Just absolutely lose their minds. And they bring the blind man in and question him twice. Trying to find something that they can use against Jesus. And all that the blind man could do, all that the blind man did was to respond with what he knew, what he had experienced, and that's what a witness is called to do. In fact, if you go to John the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 25, listen to this. Talking about the blind man here. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I do know, I was blind. But now I see. They ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? I love that story. I bet there was some swagger to that kid. The most effective witness is the one that shares what he has experienced and knows firsthand to be true. Third, we may be asked to, to witness in uncomfortable situations. You know, in the story of Naaman, we find the actions of the servant girl and the other servants to their mistress and master uh, as they are sharing with them to be in an uncomfortable situation. If, if the mistress or the master didn't like the way they were being approached, it could have been the end. Or if they had gone to, to the prophet Elisha and nothing had happened, it could have been the end. But that didn't stop them from sharing because their desire was to share something that they thought could make a difference in Naaman's life. You see, we too find ourselves in situations where we have an opportunity to share the truth of God with those around us. It could be the way to salvation, it could be the way to have comfort from God. It could be the way to have a specific answer in life. And sometimes those opportunities may come in, situa in situations or settings where we're uncomfortable. We need to adapt the attitude of the servants of the story here and forge on. Trusting God to be with us and share what we know to be true. Because we have the source of eternity that we can share with others. And we need to be willing. I've often heard it said, do you love someone enough to share about heaven and hell? Or do you not care if they go to heaven? The fourth thing, we need to trust God to make a difference when we witness. I am struck by the trust that's displayed by the servants in this story. The servant girl trusted Elisha. She, she said, send him to Elisha. Elisha can heal him. The servant said, look, he didn't ask you to do anything great. He didn't ask you to do that. You do it. All he's asking you to go get in the water. You know, there's no doubt that they believed that Elisha could do what Naaman needed. Verse 3, she said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And then in verse 13, Naaman's servants, servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great things, 
would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you to watch and be cleansed? But I think the best example of this whole story is Elisha. He doesn't even leave the house. He doesn't even leave the house. Why? Because he wanted to make sure that God got the glory for what was about to happen. If we don't care who gets the glory, then, then it's not hard to witness. Because he's going to make the difference. All we're going to do is share. The final thing. We need to trust God with the outcome of our witness. We live in a result-based society. Success and failure is strictly given out based on your results. That's not the way the gospel works. We're simply to go and share. We're simply to go give our witness. None of them healed Naaman. None of the servants, Elisha, Elisha's servants, none of them. God healed Naaman. And we need to trust that God is going to do what's best. If he asks us to go, we just got to go. If he asks us to say something, we need to say it. And we need to understand that any outcome that comes belongs to God. Listen to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, beginning with verse 5. He says, What after all is Apollos and what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned each to his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. To neither, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes the things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose. And they each will be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. God's building. God says surrender your life. Be my witness. Share the truth. Tell others what I've done for you. And allow me to complete the work in you and begin others on their path. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for the Word of God and the examples it gives us of being a witness. Father, we pray that we will take the lessons we learn from the story of Naaman and apply them in our own lives. Help us to be better witnesses for you. And that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The story of Naaman is a great story because the power of God is on display. But the power of God doesn't get displayed if there aren't people sharing their witness. That's the only way Naaman heard about Elisha. That's the only way he ends up in the Jordan is because he had service that came and said, Look, this is a small thing. Go get the water. It doesn't happen if those people don't witness. We talk about the church and the health of the church and the growth of the church. 
you know, the health is good and growth happens when we're sharing our witness. You have influence with people that I will never see. That the elders will never see. And you can make a difference in their lives. And you don't have to have a chapter and verse. You just have to be willing to go and say, well, here's where it was. And here's where I am. And the difference between here and here is that right there. Let me tell you what that does for me. And let me show you how to have it do it for you. That's being a witness. The only way you can be a witness for God is to have a relationship with Him. And the Bible says that's easy to do. All you have to do is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Proclaim Him as your Lord. Repent of your sins. Confess Him before men. And be buried in the waters of baptism. And you will be forgiven of your sins. And you have a story then that becomes a part of your witness. If that's something that you need, won't you come as we stand and sing?